everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Music Biz Weekly episode. <laughs> I was wondering what you were going to say. <laughs> That's kind of a, a foreshadowing of what we get into with this. You'll week's get that. Guest. In a minute. You'll get that in, in a few minutes when we get into our discussion with this week's amazing guest. Um, but uh, Jay, before we get started on that, just a yeah. quick shout out to um, fine, fine folks at hypebot.com and bands in town. Thank you for everything you do. And of course, to our uh, sponsor, discmakers.com. We know it's a digital world, but there's still an important role for physical media for today's independent musicians. Digital, ro digital royalty payments. Say that three times. It's easy fast. for you to say. Are so small that selling products like CD, vinyl, T-shirts online and at gigs has become, actually has always been an important income generator. Mm -hmm. For every CD you sell online or at a gig, you might need roughly 3,000 streams to make the same amount of money. And that's a lot of streams. That's a lot of work. That's a lot of promotion. Yep. Our friends at Disc Makers are the place to go for your discs and other physical media, including vinyl, USB drives, and even T-shirts. Bands are nothing more than T-shirt factories. Remember that. <laughs> so head over to DiscMakers.com. Place an order for 100 or more CDs. And when you check out, use the promo code FREEBIZ, all one word, and you will save $150, up to $150 in shipping costs. Yeah. Uh, this week, we are joined by an incredible guest. Yeah, we have Will Page, uh, who's written a great new book we're going to talk about. Will was the former chief economist at Spotify, and uh, it's just a fascinating book, a fascinating guy, uh, a great conversation. Yeah, uh, you know, we we kind of talk about where's the music industry going. When What's do we that next vine? When, when do we let go of the vine we are holding tightly to now and grab the next vine? And you'll get that when we talk to Will. Let it roll. Today, we are joined by Will Page. Uh, Will is a visiting fellow, you'll have to tell me about that, at London School of Economics, former mm -hmm. chief economist at Spotify and uh, PRS for Music, based in London. But what I'm excited about, he's the author of Tarzan Economics, Eight Principles for Pivoting Through Disruption. This is the best book I have read in years. I rarely read a book Thank twice, you. Will, but I am going to read this one. It'll make you laugh. It'll make you cry. <laughs> Will, <laughs> Will, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much. I'm loving your podcast too. It really stands out from the crowd. So great to be on it. Thank, thank you. Awesome. Awesome. So Man, I, I want to kick it off. Well, first of all, I want to tell everyone that you wrote a piece a couple weeks ago, this uh, Twitch's Rockonomics. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've been following you for years, but that particular piece blew my mind because I'm so entrenched in Twitch right now. And, you know, we've had Karen Allen on the phone who's or on the phone on the podcast podcast who's written a book on Twitch and it's really a great way for artists to monetize and grow their base, blah, blah, blah. But your piece was the best piece I'd ever written. And it was laid out so beautifully graphically that I was telling everybody about it. And my friend, Glenn Peoples, our, our mutual friend, Glenn said, well, you know, you got to talk to Will and you and I had a, a nice conversation and I was just that kind of led me into learning about your book and kind of digging into your book. But with your experience, I mean, there, I could talk to you for hours, but let's just start off with what's an economist? <laughs> like, how did you fall into that? Well, my hop, <laughs> skip and jump to the, the very, very final sentence of the book. It says, don't wait for your job description, create your job description. Yep. Love that. And that actually came out of me when I was doing a bunch of lectures for women in STEM subjects at schools over here in Britain. And they're asking, well, how did you get your job? Well, I created it. And there was no job advert saying we need an economist. There's lots of lawyers, lots of people in marketing, not one you know, job advert for an economist. And if we go back to 2006, when I got my break, back then, as you know, we were staring into the abyss. Piracy yeah. was up. CDs were down. Yeah. Downloads weren't plugging the gap. And 
last one out, shut the gate, please. It, it was a tricky situation. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I've believed that I had two passions, music on one side, you know, music through and through, a DJ writing for Straight No Chaser magazine, which was Giles Peterson's publication, and working with jazz festivals around Europe, and then economics. I was working in government as an economist, and I thought if I could merge these two things up, I could create a role for myself to do what I'm passionate about. And I believed economics could help turn this business around. So that's a long-winded answer. There is a five-word answer of what Rockonomics does, which is have a rocking good time. You can take your pick. But yeah, it's it's really important, I think, for, for your audience to appreciate in a time of disruption, accelerated disruption, you know, those job adverts that are up there, those job descriptions aren't fit for purpose. You're far better telling the employer what you could bring to them as opposed to expect them to know what they want from you. We've got to turn the tables on this. Yeah, I thought uh, economics was about money. And the more I learn about economics, the more it seems it's more about human behavior. Mm-hmm. And what I really enjoyed, and I'd love for you to talk about this uh, for a second, is to tell the audience about that, that story about you and your dad at at the ocean, right? Talk about that because I feel like that is kind of encapsulates a lot of these things. We assume that something is a certain way or by doing something, it will end up being something else, but sometimes it's the opposite of that. Well, you just mentioned an ocean. I presume you're on the Pacific time zone. <laughs> on Scotland, we look at the North Sea, which isn't an ocean. Okay. So a, a quick correction there. It's deep. Okay. I stand It's corrected. windy. It's choppy, but it's not quite as big. <laughs> okay. um, so, yeah, I, it, it's, a, it's an interesting story because I can tell you and your listeners a story with a twist that will apply to how a lawyer is going to answer the question that I'm going to ask you in a second. So... If I roll back the years to when I was 11 years old, which is around about the time of Henry VIII and the Tudors, <laughs> if I go back to that period, um, I learned that my older brother, Tom, who's much bigger than me, um, much better rugby player than me, because if he could actually tackle as opposed to fall over. Uh, but yeah, I, I heard he learned what economics was. My dad had taught him, my dad, a maths and economics teacher, taught him what economics was. And you know what? Sibling rivalry kicked in. I was jealous. You got to tell me, Dad, because I got to catch up with him. He's two years older than me, two feet taller than me, but I need to catch up with him. And my dad was on his summer holidays. Teachers get long summer holidays. He's like, you know, pardon the language, piss off, son. I'm busy. I'm going to go back to work. I'm on my holidays. <laughs> my dad, Dad, you can't tell Tom something that I don't get to know about. Teach me what economics is, Dad. He's like, come on, it's summer. Later, ask me another time. Dad, you've got to teach me what economics is. And we're at this beach. I'm like, tell me what Tom knows, because I need to know. So my dad gives me this example. He says, let's pretend you're the prime minister of the country, okay? And I'm going to give you a tragic story, which is up and down this country's coastline, British kids have been drowning at British beaches. We're learning that the number of kids drowning in our own waters is rocketing. And you're going to walk out at number 10 Downing Street. You're going to stare grieving parents in the face. You're going to stare hostile politicians in the face. And you're going to stare angry press in the face. I'm going to put you on the spot to see what you do, because I want you, back then, Billy Page, 11-year-old kid in Scotland, to tell these people what you're going to do to stop these British kids from drowning in British water. F me, Dad. What a challenging task that is. Let me think. Let me think. I have to come up with a policy response, right? I have to come up with a, we've seen an event happen, and this is super relevant in the time of a pandemic. What's my response? Let me ask you guys, if you were that 11-year-old kid on a beach in Scotland in the summertime, and by the way, our summer ashore, I mean, we have two seasons, winter and June. This wasn't June. Winter but if you, June. Were that kid, if you were that kid, <laughs> what would you do as a policy response? I'll let Mike answer because I've I've Man. read it and I know where this is going. So I'm going to let yeah, Mike. Yeah, you know, that's a that's a heavy question, and I'm 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 sitting here going, all right, I've got to put myself into my 11 year old shoes, and the brain of an 11 year old as to what you're thinking and what your where 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 your head is at. Because mm. what, you know, what, what your, what your dad said to you is like true, but that 
to me, because I've got a seven-year-old daughter, that's all stuff that they're going to just be like, holy crap, that just explodes my head just on its own. It did for me. Just the fact that you're saying I got to deal with this, this, and this. Because an 11 year old kid, you're looking at one, your, your view is very simplistic at 11 years old. Well, here's what this 11 year old kid said. I said, dad, I'm going to make swimming compulsory. That's my policy response. I'll walk out at number 10 down the street. And that's what I'm going to tell the people under my government. Swimming is now compulsory. And my dad sat me down and said, wait a second, that's politics. And we've seen a lot of politics over the past 14 months. Let's do some economics. What do we know about what happened, son? Kids were drowning, Dad, and that makes me sad. Okay, okay. Where were those kids? They were at the beach, Dad. Where in the beach were those kids? Well, Dad, they were in the water. Okay. What does that tell you about their ability to swim or not? That means they could swim, Dad. Why did you say that? Because, Dad, kids who can't swim don't go into water. Right there, the penny dropped. What am I going to do? I'm going to make swimming compulsory. So we'll have more kids who can swim. So then my dad posed a question, will we have more or less kids in the water? We're going to have more dad. And if 0.001% of them tragically drown, are we going to have more or less deaths as a result of your policy? We're going to have more dad. My best intentions Mm -hmm. would have made the problem worse. And from that day onwards, that's been my motivation in economics, teaching people about inconvenient truths. And I asked him, so, okay, maybe I screwed up there, but what is the solution? He said, well, look at this speech. We could have a flag system, regulation, green, amber, red for when the current's too strong. That beach, by the way, Pease Bay in Scotland, I'm from a small town very close to Dunbar, which is the birthplace of a certain John Muir, which... <clears throat> Needs no introduction for the Americans. And uh, <coughs> pardon my voice. And yeah, so <coughs> pardon me, you can cut. No worries. And um, so, you know, he, he said you could have a flag system to inform the children and their parents, you know, red is dangerous, amber is risky, green is okay. You could regulate which, you know, beaches are accessible during, you know, strong currents. Like, okay, so regulation and information solves the problem. Making swimming compulsory accentuates the problem. So that's a nice way of learning how to apply economics to abstract situations, different symptoms, different cures. What I want to land is, is this point, which is when I moved to London in 2006 to take up the role of chief economist of the PRS, The same question you guys asked me was asked by the general counsel of that organization. She sat down over lunch at your table and said, Will, how did you get into economics? And I told her the same story that your listeners have now heard. And when it came to asking her, well, now you've heard my story, what would you have done if you're an 11-year-old at the beach with your parents and posed that question? And do you know what the lawyer said to me? I just banned the kids from swimming. <laughs> I think we can go from that beach in Scotland as an 11 year old to the debate about Napster quite quickly here. And you can see the parallel of seeing different solutions for different problems. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You, you talk a lot ban about the kids Napster. from swimming. <laughs> I, I think that Napster is such a great comparison because I was working in the industry and was involved in those meetings. And you were absolutely right. Most of the people in the music industry were like, we got to kill this thing. We have to just shoot it and watch it die. But there were also those, and BMG was one of them, that were a little bit more forward thinking and were like, wait a second. And you mentioned um, Eric Garland and Big Champagne in your book. Mm -hmm. And the, the point, and I would love to get your thoughts on this, what for those that don't know, Big Champagne, you know, Eric and Ethan had this company that could measure file trading, bit torrents, you know, peer to peer file trading. And so for the first time in our industry, really, we could tell what our customers 
what that behavior was. And they broke it out by DMA, designate, designated marketing areas, just like SoundScan did. And everybody was throwing Eric out of their offices. And until Jimmy Iovine went, wait a second, you can measure what people are actually doing with music in all of these markets. And then he started thinking, well, you know, we can, maybe we're not putting out the right track. Maybe it should be this track and so on. And they got it. They got big champagne. BMG got the power of Napster, you know, like maybe those Metallica fans, we could look at their behavior and maybe they also listen to Lyle Lovett. Maybe we should put them on tour together. It sounds absurd, but we really didn't know what that behavior was. I'd love for you to talk a little bit about some of the comparisons you make about how the music industry handled that whole Napster situation. Yeah, well, you just mentioned Eric Garland, Big Champagne and Measure. I should maybe just flag that I, I had to get Eric Garland, who's a big man from Big Champagne Measure, to wear a kilt once. And that was a big kilt to cover his kneecaps, I think it is. He's uh, a tall dude. Well. Yeah, that was an unusual size kilt. We had to get that. Do you have any photos there. you could share with me, Will? Uh, <laughs> yeah, from the waist upwards, I think. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, there might so, be some money in this. <laughs> Um, yeah, that, that period is just interesting. You know, the, the, the thing which you know you alluded to there was one of the biggest clients for that big champagne data were the marketing departments of record labels. So I'm sitting in a bedroom in Edinburgh thinking, how on earth am I going to get into the music business? How am I going to write the job description because there is no job description? How am I going to get this door to open up and when I learned that not only was the same record label with the same CFO structure employing lawyers to sue the kids for file sharing, they were spending millions and they were losing billions. Don't forget it. We can't go back to that ever again. We did that for a decade. But they were employing lawyers to sue the kids, but they were employing marketing departments who were buying the data the kids were making. And when I realized of this of all the inconvenient truths I was digging up around that time, when I got that one, I, I had the bit between the deep. I was like a dog on heat. I was like, I've got to get into this business because this is just, we are driving ourselves to a cliff edge here. How on earth can you have the marketing team saying, hey, my piracy data is not big enough. I'm not going to have a hit here. And then lawyers on the same payroll suing the kids for creating that piracy data. Mm -mm. Turn around, find another route, you know. Yeah. 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 It's, it's absolutely fascinating. Let's, let's talk about the, the book a little bit. The Jim Griffin has a really great uh, quote, you know, in the book and I, I thought it really encapsulated and I'd love to get your thoughts on it. I'm just going to read a couple of sentences of it. It says economics captures a conundrum economics, meaning Tarzan economics, captures a conundrum we now face post-COVID-19. We cling to this old vine that keeps us off the jungle floor. At the same time, we lack the confidence to swing for the new vine. The trick is figuring out when to let go. I mean, that's the book when, right there. When, that key word, when. There's a gazillion books about hows and whys. There's not many about when. And I think I come at it from that angle. That quote I first heard in a bar in Norway in 2007, when I met Jim Griffin. Really? You, know, you can actually hear him from Scotland if he's in Norway. His voice is that loud. <laughs> travels the North Sea. I mean, the oil rigs are always complaining, but um, wow. I have to thank, it's a very important economic point here, Norwegian bar prices, I have to thank for the title of that book because usually you'd get absolutely even drunk with someone like Jim Griffin and share stories, but because beer was that expensive in that country, I was sober enough to write it down and remember it the next day and think maybe one day I could write a book around that. So it's been an ambition for years, a decades, uh, as it were. But yeah, his, his observation is just so beautiful because you immediately visualize Tarzan holding onto an old vine and then trying to work out when to let go and reach out to the new. And we know the music story. You guys cover it better than anyone. We spent 10 years holding on to that old vine, hoping kids were going to go back yeah. to opening CDs and busting their nails in the process. Well, I was just going to ask you, I mean, that my question, when, when, is, when are we going to 
give up holding on to the vine of CDs because we're still holding on. There's still people holding on as tight as they can that, oh my God, CDs are not quite dying out. Oh my God, mm -hmm. look at the surge in vinyl sales. That means physical products are coming back. When are we going to let go of that vine and, and grab the vine that is not even downloads streaming because that's, and what comes after that vine? Right. And that's where you start throwing your hands in the air like a good economist would do and swinging from vines to vines to vines. And like you, you're already hearing people like Mark Geiger talk about the post Spotify economy. And to a certain extent, you know, we've had the 999 price point since 2002. So next yeah. year will be the two decade anniversary of charging 999 Crazy. for an all you can eat bundle. Bonkers. And by the way, and Jay, you may know this, but the origins of that price point have got nothing to do with any economist doing some complex modeling work. No, nope, there was no economist in the business back then. I was still finishing my master's at Edmund University. It has to do with shadow pricing the blockbuster rental car costs. I've seen the memo which said if it costs $9.99 to rent movies from Blockbuster, that's what it's going to cost to rent music from Rhapsody. That's your yeah. price point. What could go wrong? And in May, late May 2021, we're still asking that. So, yeah, maybe this vine that we're currently on just now is beginning to look a bit withered. And uh, we need to work out what that next vine is. And back to that Twitch report, I think there's a lot of concepts there. I'm not going to just say Twitch, but, you know, a model where it's user-centric, my channel, my money, and you go over top to get directly to your fans that's a very different vibe from the one we've been holding on to for the past 10 years. So Ralph Simon, who's been a, a friend and mentor to me for many years, has this great expression, which is the music business is all about what's happening next. It always has been. Mm -hmm. And that's what I love about this business is, hey, we've done streaming. We've done 9 We've been there, done that, read the book. What's next? What's coming down yeah. the pipe next that's going to blow my mind? And yeah, it's relentless. You know, it's as, as, as Jay and I always say, the music business now is changing so fast, so Crazy. incredibly fast that, and, and we joke, but it is somewhat serious. As we are sitting here in this conversation, something new is, is either being announced, will be revealed tomorrow, or is in a boardroom right now getting the green light to go ahead and go that direction. Mm -hmm. you know, it's not it's not taking 10 years for things to change. It is now changing weekly. Weekly yeah. things are changing. And and I feel like that's going to just get faster. And licensing always plays catch up. So you can see with live streaming right now, this mm -hmm. huge debate about licensing. That's symbolic of what's been going on for 20 years. So who does the dancing? Who calls the tune? I got a great idea. Oh, but it doesn't fit our current licensing framework. So what are we going to do? Spend five years in a holding pan with lawyers fighting it out? Or how about you change your licensing framework to suit my idea? We can bring a horse to water or we can bring water to the horse. And I think you're going to see a lot more bringing water to the horse in the next 10 years than we saw in the last 10 years. We just can't have, we've got no patience anymore. It's got to move. I agree. I think you're so right. The music industry, a lot of what it's founded on is the same things today that have been around for 75 years. And just recently with the Music Modernization Act and the MLC and all of these different innovations. And now in the UK, you know, with Parliament taking a little deeper dive at streaming, I feel like it's finally starting to pick up a little bit of speed. But I'd love to get your thoughts on what recently happened with the kind of higher quality, you know, lossless CD quality, whatever you want to call it. I felt like that the announcement from Apple was, was Huge. disappointing only because that could have been an entryway into more money being brought in for these subscriptions. I believe that, to your point, these subscription prices have been set for a long time. And there's a lot of value there. And if you look at the, the ARPU, it's even much lower than that. So how can we charge more for streaming? 
could that have been higher definition? You know, because then all of a sudden Amazon drops their pricing on higher debt. I just feel like maybe we missed an opportunity there. What do you think? A lot to unpack in this one, but you're right to flag the audio debate, as it were, as a, a, sort of a sign of things to come. Um, my first point here would be, I'm a little bit cynical about the debate about high quality audio for two reasons. One, I remember as a kid thinking, you put all this money into producing this record. And then on my Walkman, I got graphic equalizers so I can change the sound of this record. What got lost between your investment in the production and what actually gets to my eardrums, the quality of the headphones, the quality of the Walkman, the way I adjust the sound. These are all controls I've got to adjust your work. So we should not ignore the blatantly obvious, which is no matter what you try and produce in terms of the output and the technology, the consumer can distort that with how they actually receive the yeah. sound. Was there background noise when you heard that song? Maybe there wasn't. Maybe there was. Maybe you couldn't hear the song properly. You know, how do you control for that? So blatantly obvious. But a second blatantly obvious point is if I had a dollar for every time people have said, when Spotify going to increase audio quality? And I've said, you can do it. Just go to your settings and change it. Yeah. I would be a very rich man. <laughs> so did Spotify do a bad job telling people that feature was there or were they just not interested in it? So you might say, give me better quality audio, but you might not actually use it when I serve it to you. Neil Young didn't know that setting was there when he took his catalog off. We had to show him. Yeah, By I mean, way, did, 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 did Spotify know something about the users out there going, well, yeah, we got this feature, but we kind of know that it's not going to be the, the, the big reveal, the big feature that the end user mm. really wants. And, you know, I tend to agree with you on, on, on that, Will, because, you know, I was, I was there when title first dropped and I jumped into that pool of it's high quality audio. And I was doing the, I got my headphones. I'm going to listen to it on Spotify. And then I'm going to listen to it on title. And it's like, well, there's, you know, that much difference. And was it worth paying $5 more for that? And my answer yeah. as just the average, as a fan was like, no, because to your point, I'm listening through it. My white earbuds, I'm listening yeah. to it on the speakers coming out of my iPad, you know, there's so many other factors that degrade the quality of the song that the musician and the producer have no control over. And me as the fan, I'm not going to pay more for something that's still coming out of these white earbuds. At it's, the end of the day. It's something that the professor Richard Thaler uh, over in university of Chicago and the winner of the Nobel prize recently would always tell me about the curse of knowledge. The people involved in creating these high quality audio features have got no concept of what it's going to be like on the end user. They spend their life in a bat cave, walking around in high order, have no social skills, developing this technology and credit to them. But when somebody says to me, hey, have you heard this latest high quality audio product? It's like, can you tell a difference? One reaction I heard on the one the I'll not name which streaming services is, is, yeah, you can tell a difference in your car. What are the cars electric hybrid and what are the cars some diesel rust bucket that makes a roaring sound? Are we going to just make a sweeping generalization that you can tell a difference in yeah. your car? Again, yeah. just those butterfly effects, those variables that sit in terms of like what could exchange experience. But let's switch it back to Apple. That was your that, that you just hit a powder keg right there. This is big. And yeah. one thing that I admire about Apple's strategy is they always take small incremental steps forward, always in the right direction. There's no giant leaps and bounds with Apple. It's just gradually, gradually moving up the field. We're not going to use our wide receivers. We're just going to use our running back. Give me a two yard gain, a three yard gain. Let's get to first down and move it again. And this is a big one. This is, a, this is an eight yard gain by a running back. And if you've studied Bill Walsh NFL tactics, you know, an eight-yard gain from running back is viewed differently from an eight-yard gain from a wide receiver. I think this is huge. And end-to-end yeah. -end spatial audio for television and audio, podcast subscriptions working through the system, turning podcast creators into app developers, essentially. You know, 
Apple's beginning to use its wide receivers now. They're moving up the park really fast, and it's it's fascinating to watch. Yeah, but but you know, even like podcast subscriptions, is that just playing catch up? That's playing catch up because guess what? Uh, you know, you can you could do subscriptions elsewhere. You could go to the Patreon model, which so many people are into. Mm -hmm. Is is that just a, a gain for Apple to stay on par rather than a gain that kind of moves them out. Because at, before we hit the record here, when it came to podcasts, and I was saying Spotify starting to eat Apple up when it comes to podcasts. And as a long time, Jay and I are admittedly huge Apple devotees we love their ecosystem yes. the software the hardware but we're also going to come right out and say sometimes they miss the boat sometimes mm -hmm. that apple 800 pound gorilla ego gets in some way and they were always the destination for podcasts always it was you know i've been podcasting for over 10 years that was it you had to get yourself in there if you were going to go anywhere that's not the case anymore. You know, I can look at my own data and go, yeah, they're still in the top three, but the others are right on their tail. Spotify, I'm getting as many listeners out of Spotify as I am out of iTunes. I'm getting as many listens out of YouTube, which isn't even a podcast platform, as I am out of Spotify and Apple. Right there, I think uh, there's a couple of gut reactions I want to throw back at you. One, I always love to quote the film director in Hollywood, William Goldman, who said, nobody knows anything. I think that applies to the podcast world. We think we know a lot. Mm -hmm. We don't actually know that much. So my podcast has been downloaded X hundred thousand times. A download is not a listen. Repeat 10 times before going to bed at night. A download is not a listen. And there's an inconvenient truth there for advertisers, which is if you're advertising against a download, you're definitely not capturing the listen. So we have issues there. You, know, you might think that I've been listening to Freakonomics since September 2019. Truth is, I haven't. But my Apple iPod podcast app downloads every new episode. So that's one issue. Another issue, and you touched on there, where you said YouTube is not even a proper podcast platform. Let me just challenge you there. Who, who are you to say... YouTube is not a podcast platform. I think there's a bigger problem, which is oh, the goddamn word podcast. There, the word yes. iPod that you can only buy in a cash converter secondhand pawn shop in, in Kentish Town and broadcast, which is the exact opposite of what a podcast is. How do you tell somebody in Brazil or Indonesia where podcasts are exploding that this is the origins of what a podcast is? They wouldn't even know what iPod is and have no concept of a podcast. You are 100% right. If, if a consumer calls YouTube a podcast platform, well, I will follow the consumer because people who don't follow yes. the consumer tend to finish up on the hard shoulder. It, 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 exactly. I, I've been in some of these podcast groups where these podcast purists are like, mm -hmm. it's not a podcast unless it's delivered by an RSS feed, which is what podcasts are built on. And I'm like, technically... <laughs> That's the definition you might read in wiki, but I'm telling you as a podcaster and real world experience that I put a show up on YouTube and I get as many listens on YouTube as I get anywhere else. That's my podcast. And that is how the consumer is taking that podcast, absorbing that content. I'm feeling that. The consumer does not care that it wasn't delivered properly by an RSS feed. means nothing to them. They just want the content and listen to it where they enjoy their, their consumption of material, YouTube. So you're 100% right that is, is YouTube a podcast platform? Not by the purest definition of what a podcast is, but by the way a consumer uses it, it damn well is a podcast platform. Yeah, and I like to ask the question, you know, what's, what's a podcast in that I can't 
I don't have time to watch a lot of television. So there are a couple of TV news programs that I really like. So I listen to those programs at like a podcast. I listen to the audio when I go for my morning walk or, or whatnot. It's not technically a podcast. It's that news program that was on TV exactly as it was on television. Um, so I, I find that interesting, but I, I want to kind of move By forward. By the way, you just, you just said that you don't have the time to listen to stuff. Uh, no, I don't have time to watch. I have time to listen. Right. Well, here's a quick Watching joke. is, you know, I can do listening while I'm exercising or, or working or doing other things, but I, I don't have time to watch television. All right. Just on time and constraints. What's the best way to keep a secret? What's the best put way to keep a second half? Yeah. Put it in the second half of a podcast. <laughs> there you go. Part two. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Put up, um, and I'll be here all week. I want to <laughs> make sure we get this in because I, I, one of the parts of your book that I, I really loved was so bent. It was straight. And I'd love for you to kind of talk about what, <laughs> what that means. Cause I cracked up when I read it. So bent, it was straight. Industry veterans will know that what that expression. And I credit my aunt Doreen Loder, uh, who told me that when I was a kid, we'd come down to London and I'd visit her at Enzyme Records. So she ran Enzyme Records with two, a real double act, Chris Hill, who you could argue was one of the first proper superstar DJs in British nightclub culture, soul, funk, uh, that genre. Uh, he did it before anyone else, you know, toasting the microphone and so on. And then Nigel Grange, who's the half-brother of Lucian over there where you guys are at sure. Universal. Yeah. And uh, yes, that's how she described the business as it's so corrupt, it strains itself out. <laughs> and there's, I think I give two or three examples in the book of just how this works. But one of my favorite was this concept of shipping platinum and receiving gold. Yeah. So if the certification of getting a platinum or a gold disc is based on shipments, not yes. sales, and the retailer is doing sale or return, that is, how many Guns N' Roses album you, do you want? <laughs> how many are you going to give me? Because anything I can't sell, you can have back at cost as well. So because of this, and because the bonuses were based on certification, executives could ship a million copies of an album, boom, got my platinum record, got my bonus, and watch gold, half a million, come back to the factory gate. And that's an example of So Bennett Straight, which is if you design the rules that way, guess what? People are going to play by the rules. You know, yes. in rugby, we often have this debate about a New Zealand rugby player, Richie McCaw. Was he the greatest rugby player of all time or the greatest cheat? The point is he looked at the rules and bent them as far as he could without breaking the laws. So um, that would be a, a pretty cool example of just a business that was so bent at the straight. And you can apply that. I mean, this is the point about the book, not to sit in the echo chamber of music industry. That's cool. But if you look at how directors, you know, compensation is often incentivized. It's over short-term goals versus long-term sustainability. Can you make next quarter's hours and you look better? I can, but it's going to bite you in the ass in three years' time. Yeah. Not too dissimilar to shipping platinum and receiving gold. The CFO has to deal with the returns. The A&R executive, right. they're off to their new gig and got their bonus and cashed out. So That's right. it, it's, it's, funny. it's funny you bring that up as an example. And Jay, I don't know if it immediately clicked in your head, but these guys behind us on the wall, Kiss, back in <laughs> 1978, when they released four independent solo albums through Casablanca Records, each album immediately shipped platinum and came back <laughs> gold. I mean, these, I mean, it's, it's a notorious story of as far back as 1978, those solo albums bombed yet. They got platinum albums right away. They could say it was a huge success because it's not it was fraud. Not, it's marketing. It, it was not based on sales. It was based on, we shipped out yeah, of our warehouse sales a million copies of each album. Oh yeah. It only actually sold a half a million. Yeah. I guess yeah. famously they kiss tried to trademark the dollar bill symbol. You know that Gene, yeah, Gene Simmons. Yeah. The yeah. Dollar sign, he yeah. realized nobody had trademarked the dollar. So he wants to spell kiss with $2 signs. That's hilarious. Let me, let me ask you this. Will 
with Spotify, and you've had a lot of experience with Spotify. Um, I, I I love how they're innovating. Um, I I love the platform, but the one part of it I don't like is the fact that they put stream counts next to tracks, and I find that that causes people to say, "I need that number up. I need to show that." data point to people and impress them and get what I need, the tour that I need or the publicity I need or the artist mm -hmm. manager that I need. Yeah, I got it. And uh, people are gaming the system. Um, we've seen it time and time again, where people are getting caught with spin farms and bots. And there, there's a really great piece um, in Rolling Stone recently where they have a recording of someone who's guaranteeing millions of streams to jack those numbers up. Now you and I both know that there's no engagement with those numbers and that it's pretty easy to see when someone's kind of gaming the system. What, what are your thoughts on Spotify having the streaming number there? Um, do you have any, any opinion on that? A ton. I mean, firstly, I think the Rolling Stone piece you're referring to was written by Elias Light. Is that right? Yes, that's right. I give him a 10. Like, in terms of investigative journalism in this business, like, he is... I will on, give him a on. 10, but the story was fed to him by a friend of mine. And I have the full recording. They have uh, excerpts in, right. in that. Um, but... He did an excellent job, but anyway, please. I just go ahead. yeah, I mean, I just want to say I wish there was more people like him trying to get to grips with this business as yes. opposed to regurgitating press releases. You know, I'm just getting a bit sick and tired of reading a press release and being you know, watching it being masqueraded like it was journalism. But yeah, yeah. to this point, I mean, I think we've got some issues here, quite a few issues. Uh, I remember like people were boasting about, hey, did you know that your number one city on Spotify was Jakarta, Indonesia? You've never even been there before. And I started saying, <laughs> I don't think we want to be pointing this out because <laughs> I don't think they are real streams. Um, there's one thing that you can say about stream fraud is it's a bigger problem than we know it is. And we have to be careful with the stats here. I mean, just wheel back for a second and the best reminder about trying to understand statistics is what I call the crime stats dilemma. If I tell you that crime stats is going up, what does that tell you? Does it tell you that crime's going up? Or Maybe the does it tell you that it? we're getting better at catching criminals? Or, third option here, have we changed the definition of what crime is? If I legalize cannabis, crime stats might go down. It's got nothing to do with crime. It's got everything to do with the definition. Yes, and amen to legalizing cannabis, bring it over here. But still, so let's be careful about what we're trying to measure when we measure something that we don't quite know, a known unknown, to quote Donald Rumsfeld of fraud. Um, but yeah, there is a problem, but having numbers next to streams might accentuate that problem. But I remember a long time campaigning to get those numbers up next to streams. And I always use YouTube as an example, which very quickly made the popular visible and the visible popular. If you go back to, God, when was it? 2008, 2009, when Susan Boyle exploded on YouTube. Susan Boyle, a 55-year-old Scot who's never had a kiss. Sure. Explodes mm -hmm. on YouTube. Amazing voice. So I think what made her popular was not the performance. It was the stream counts. Have you seen it? It's 10 million. Have you seen it? It's 50 million. Have you seen it? It's 100 million. And that became a self-fulfilling, you know, a flywheel, if you want, of just the more visible the stream counts were, the more popular it became. You know, in those years, Spotify didn't have them. So I thought, you know, having the numbers next to streams would be a good thing. And I still think it's a good thing. It brings yeah. with it some costs, but we want to, we want to uh, disaggregate, you know, the popularity and visibility concept. That's why we have charts, by the way. They make popular visible and the visible more popular versus the issues of fraud. I think you have to you have to separate those two things out. So yeah. so you know if those stream counts remain, does that mean Spotify needs to put more effort then into battling the people who are gaming the systems, the bot farms, the fake streams? 
Uh, yeah, I mean, I think more resource across all the streaming services is there. And by the way, let's just remind ourselves about that dilemma of crime stats. You're picking on Spotify here. Yes. You're not picking on Apple or Amazon. And you might say, you know why? Because they don't have any stream forward. And you know why that is? Because you haven't been able to see it yet. So just remember that crime stats analogy. Is it because crime's gone yep. up? I've got better at catching yeah, criminals. That's really, yeah. It's very important that we be very even-handed here. Yes. There's a fixed pot of cash. There's a pro rata distribution. If you get 1% yes. of all the streams, you get 1% of all the money. Any system like that is going to incentivize fraudulent clicks, especially yeah. on the free tier. Yeah, and you, so, you oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. So, so, so just on there, I think there's two things which your listeners may not have thought about with this critical subject, which is in terms of remedies, cures, um, I think closing down the time it takes to detect fraudulent activity is a big one that nobody discusses and removing the incentives to that course activity in the first place. So most people go through the front door on this one, just stamp out fraud, you know, just ban kids from swimming in the beach. I'm going to go around the back door and I think reducing the time it takes to detect the problem and removing the incentives that create the problem may not be the most obvious solution, Yeah, but the opposite of a good idea can guess what? That can also be a good idea. I think yeah. that is the path that all streaming services should be looking at, spoken, not just Spotify. Yeah, spoken like an economist. Well, so oh, listen. God. My apologies. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Look, I get me back on Kiss. We can get back to movies and music. <laughs> so, Will, what what are your take on non fungible tokens, NFTs? In my book, I enter chapter one with a very simple framework which asks what type of good you're trying to sell. This gets lost when you know, organizations become distressed or face disruption, but I simply ask two questions. Is what you're trying to sell scarce or not? And is it excludable or not? And a CD, which you guys can relate to back in the day, was scarce. So there's one copy of that CD left on the shelf, and I get it, you guys can't. And it's excludable. There's a big, nasty security guard in that shop door forcing me to pay. And we know what happens after that with piracy. You know, you remove scarcity, you remove excludability. How do you resolve the nature of the good that you're actually selling? Now, when I think to NFTs, I go back to a band that is visualizing this for the listeners across all of your walls, which is that band Kiss. In 1975, Kiss did a marketing campaign, which for me was the first NFT ever. And hear me out. You might think I've been drinking too much Sherry Car Malt Whiskey here, but follow me, follow me, please. Kiss said to their huge fan base, and you know how big Kiss Army was. They bought everything, Kiss models, Kiss wallpaper, Kiss toilet paper. I mean, you could wipe your butt to Gene Simmons with his tongue out. They invented Kiss toilet paper. That was a popular item. But they had this competition which said, we're going to send out to five lucky winners an envelope with a photograph of the band with the famous makeup removed. Slides went spats. Like, finally, you're going to see Gene and Paul with the makeup off. Everyone entered the competition. Now, here's the twist. Those five lucky winners of the competition received this envelope, would untie this envelope, remove the taping around it, and pull out a photograph of Kiss with the makeup off. But the thing was, as soon as that photograph was exposed to natural light, after five seconds, the image disappeared. Genius, genius marketing. And I don't see much difference between what Gene and Paul did in 1975 and what NFTs are doing today. You're just reinventing scarcity in a world where scarcity has been lost. Wow. Wow, yeah. Well said. Definitely. Well, listen, I, I highly recommend this book. I, I am so glad that we got to to chat. It's been such an honor. I, I, I hope everybody goes out to get it. Be, before we wrap up here, Will, where can people find out about you? Where can they get your book? Um, where, where can they reach out to you? So the, we have the book website, tarsoneconomics.com. And I create credit Freya Rose Hannah, a wonderful woman who built that website. She said to me, all right, I'm going to build your website. Who's it for? And the gut reaction for me, and this is the God's honest truth, was for students. 
I love nothing more than teaching economics, especially when it's to a student population who's going to be going into the music industry tomorrow. It's like what you guys were saying earlier, like where does this business go next? So it's not just about the book. I've put every single publication I've done since 2006 up there, try to make as many resources available. Yeah. So, you know, just you know, whether you're a C-level executive in Santa Monica or whether you're a student at the Los Angeles College of Music, that website is for you guys to use and abuse, squeeze like a sponge, and hopefully make tomorrow better than today in this crazy ass business that we're in. So yeah. Carsoneconomics.com is there. And then the book is up there on all your usual retailers that begin with A, Amazon, yes. <laughs> and Audible. Uh, very good on Audible. Uh, we got Angus King to read it. That's one of the nice. weirdest letters you ever get when you're a first-time <laughs> author, which is, who do you want to read that book? And I got that letter the day that Sean Connery passed away. So obviously it wasn't going to be him, but uh, right. Angus King read the book Shuggy Bain, which won the Booker Prize over here in the UK. It's a big success, and he's reading my book. My parents are a bit frustrated because he sounds like he's from Glasgow as opposed to Edinburgh, but we got a Scottish accent. All so right. Nice. All right. No, that's, that's brilliant. That's absolutely brilliant. And that's the only version of the book I don't have. And I'm a big fan of audiobooks. Um, mm. It's, it, it, it's so great to, you know, go for a long walk and just immerse yourself into a great uh, audio book. Um, Will, thank you so much uh, for taking the time out of your busy day. It's always a pleasure talking with you. Discmakers.com. Use code FREEBIZ for ground shipping on CD orders of 100 units or more, $150 value. Boy, you know, I felt like with Will, we should have sat here and gone, okay, we need to block out two hours. Yes, I was thinking the same thing. Two hours, because we mm -hmm. really, it was just so at the high, such a high level here. Uh, yeah. But but what we could have dug deep into and 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 maybe we do that maybe we block out a special episode upcoming here where we have Will back for you know an hour hour and a half to really get into all of this but uh, fascinating I mean I was just like it, he was the type yeah. of person where you just want to sit there and absorb it yeah. Yeah, I could sit with him for hours. I've been following his writing for many years, and I've posted a lot of his pieces in Your Morning Coffee, my weekly newsletter. And it wasn't really until that Twitch's Rockonomics story, and I encourage people to dig that up. It was just so well written. And as you could tell from the interview, he's a funny guy. Yeah. And he's witty, he's smart. And he has a way of writing that's it's really fun to read and fun to follow along with. And I highly recommend the book. But what a what a fun conversation. Yeah, for sure. Loved it. Loved it so much. Um, so depending on where you are listening or watching <laughs> this podcast, why do we call it a podcast? And, and funny side story, when I first got into podcasting, like, 10 years ago, I was like, I don't want to call it a podcast. Yeah. I want to call it an episode, a webisode, because that's all these are, are weekly episodes of a show, whether it's a TV show, a radio show, whatever yeah. it is. And mainly because in the consumer's mind, they understand what an episode is. Yeah, but the name stuck. I mean, the, you the know, Leo Laporte calls him a netcast. So if you listen to Leo Laporte's yep. podcast series, he says, you know, netcasts you love. And I think netcast is interesting, but it's kind of like Kleenex. You know, it's it's become this generic A thing. Podcast has become very generic, but at the same time, the term podcast, and I've experienced this, especially with my parents and, and older relatives, they're like, how do I get your podcast? Yeah. What do I do? I don't have an iPod. Yeah, you know, and and that's the challenge. The word podcast just naturally brings along this sure. technical requirement that you have to understand. And you don't. It is nothing more than going somewhere and hitting the play button. That's yeah. it. Yeah. So regardless of where you're listening to this podcast, if you're <laughs> listening to it on YouTube as a podcast, because I'll call it a podcast on YouTube. Uh, hit that subscribe button so you don't miss another episode. Spotify, of course, follow us. iTunes, hit the subscribe button. And we're even on, on Twitch now. You can yep. tune in uh, every week 
and watch a live stream of, of that week's episode. Is, is Twitch a podcast platform? Uh, you say technically, tomato. technically no, but I count it as a play. Yeah. A if play. there's a, if there's a play of this podcast episode on Twitch, it goes into the stats as yeah. a consumption of a play this is a show. play. A play is a play. So yeah, I mean, I, I I I that's what I would really love to dig into more with with him as well as you know we got to get past these pure purest definitions of what yeah. something is pure definition of a podcast the audio files who live for the high quality audio but as we talk at the end of the day you're listening to it in this thing and it's Does doesn't it matter how quality it is yeah yeah what what you know that would be a great follow-up with will what would consumers pay more money for from a streaming platform yeah What's worth upping What's the valuable? Yeah, going from nine ninety nine to fourteen ninety nine. What would that extra five dollars get me? And am I willing to pay for? Because that's what you know. That's the next vine, basically. To, to the analogy we had, what's that vine that's going to get people to pay yeah. more? Yeah, and what's that vine that is the post Spotify economy that they were talking about? You know, what comes after? Because there's always something after. If you look at downloads as a configuration, we're allowed, we're around the shortest amount of time. Vinyl, cassettes, you know, um, streaming, everything has been around more than downloads. Well, what's coming after streaming? Who knows? But uh, leave it to the economists. They'll figure it out. Exactly. So, um, yeah, please follow, subscribe wherever you, you are listening and playing us. It means a lot to us. And, of course, a big shout out to our supporters, HypeBot and Bands in Town and our sponsor, DiscMaker.com. Thank you so much. And uh, we'll see everybody next episode.